future of work, it is hybrid. It is going to be hybrid and you're going to have to deal with both employees in the office as we talked about as well as at home. Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Post. Today on our continuing series about the COVID pandemic, uh, the path forward, our guest is Chuck Robbins, who's the chief executive of Cisco Systems, one of the companies that has built out the infrastructure of our digital world. Uh, Chuck Robbins, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, David, it's great to be here with you. Good morning. So uh, let me begin, Chuck, by asking about the infrastructure bill that is part of President Biden's uh, COVID response package that's now before Congress. There have been intense negotiations. There's a piece of that uh, infrastructure package that affects your company directly that involves broadband access and rural broadband. From what your uh, folks uh, on the Hill tell you, what, what you hear, how, how, how are those negotiations going? And are you confident that the p piece of that bill that matters to your company is going to survive in the, in the final version? Well, David, I think that the good news is, is that both sides of the aisle believe that infrastructure is super important. And the one aspect that they completely agree on is that this rural broadband initiative or this broadband connectivity out to every American is so important. And I think that over the last 15 months, the need for this broadband has been highlighted in a way that we've never seen before, where we have students who needed to try to get online and learn. And if you didn't have high-speed broadband, you were certainly at a disadvantage. Uh, we've learned that we can deliver telehealth now out to people in remote areas. So. I think they agree on that part of the bill for sure, but there's also other aspects of this bill. We're talking about delivering telehealth. We're talking about delivering connectivity, higher speed connectivity into schools for all of our you know, children. Uh, and the other aspect is the roads, the bridges, all the hard infrastructure, but that also has technology in it now. And we, we launched a whole suite of industrial networking products this week that actually help connect all of these, you know, these hardened infrastructure projects. So. There's a lot in there that uh, is very important to our country, and I'm encouraged that at least both sides are making an effort to get something done, and I'm hopeful that they will. Well, that's, we all look for the areas where there, there is actually bipartisan agreement. Give our viewers a, a sense of the dimensions of this connectivity problem, especially in rural America, in big cities like uh, Washington area where Many of our viewers are. We obviously have broadband, but but talk about what it's like around the country and, and how far we still have to go. Well, I think there's 20 million American households that still don't have you know high speed broadband connectivity. And I think as we tackle this issue in our country of inequality, this entire infrastructure bill is so important because first and foremost, it creates jobs for people. Uh, secondly, it does create you know, bring connectivity to these homes where half the workers in the United States actually say they can't do their jobs without high speed connectivity. So it's super important. And once we get that connectivity, the pandemic has proven that we can have people work from anywhere. So we can actually create jobs where people don't have to relocate. We can take the jobs to them in ways that we didn't think was possible 18 months ago. So I think it's critically important for the students, it's critically important for the parents who wanna work. Uh, and it's just critically important in helping solve this inequality issue that we see in our country. And not to get down into the weeds too much, Chuck, but but is the uh, rural connectivity connectivity uh, infrastructure uh, part of this uh, package included in both the bipartisan uh, formula that Republicans and Democrats are working up and in the larger bill that the Democrats might seek to push through through reconciliation if the bipartisan effort fails? Yeah, I think the broadband issue is the one that uh, is being included in most every version that we've, that we're aware of. And I think it's a, you know, it's, it's just a reflection of what's been highlighted, particularly in the last 15 months, where these, these, you know, there was such a divide relative to the students who had access to broadband and their ability to continue to learn and those who did not. So I do think it's uh, it's something that both sides of the aisle are very committed to. 
I, I gather that Cisco has a broadband initiative that you're actually announcing this morning. Maybe you could tell our viewers a little bit about what's in that and, and why you think it's important. Well, we're, we're uh, launching a rural broadband uh, innovation center in North Carolina. And we think it's important because a lot of the connectivity that needs to be delivered are going to be delivered by some of the major carriers in the United States, but also delivered by a lot of the smaller independent uh, connectivity companies out in rural parts of the country. And so we wanted to create a place where those, those providers could come and get hands-on experience with the technology that's actually going to make it possible. New technologies like 5G that are going to be used to deliver some of this connectivity out into remote areas. And so we, we've announced the uh, initiative this morning. Uh, we're putting $20 million into it to get it started. And uh, we're excited about what we're going to be able to show off. And a lot of the great new technology that we've been announcing over the last few months will be on display there. Uh, tell us a little bit about what uh, connected smart systems could mean in, in terms of how some of our basic infrastructure works better. I'm thinking of the 2020 uh, snow and ice uh, disaster in, in Texas that led to, to serious loss of life, uh, danger for people. Is, is, is that a, a problem that in the future, uh, smarter systems, connected systems will be able to, to solve? Well, I think what you'll find is that smarter, more connected systems can react more quickly, can signal uh, potential risks and potential problems ahead of time. I mean, we're, we're actually building some technology today built on artificial intelligence that is, is to the tune of about 70% accuracy right now, predicting future internet outages. So that's an example of how the technology can help you know when there's going to be a problem. It clearly connects people so that they can communicate, assuming they still have power, uh, that they can communicate uh, during those times. And I think that it's really important whether you're connecting you know, electrical grids or we're, co we're connecting bridges and roads, when you put the underlying new technology into that hardened infrastructure, it can signal to you when there's an impending failure, which can subsequently save lives. So it's a, it is really important for us to move forward and to do this right. We have an opportunity not only to go after and provide this the standard infrastructure that we all understand, but but really focus on delivering smart infrastructure that can do those kinds of things. It can signal when there's a potential problem so that we can uh, potentially save some of the lives and, and give signals before you know a bridge is going to be at risk, as an example. So I think it's super important. This uh, predictive AI, as people sometimes call it, is one of my favorite uh, frontiers of technology, the idea of having pumps that will tell you when they're about to fail, or I, thought, I hadn't thought about, about the example of bridges that tell you when the next truck may be the last one. But uh, are we heading into, into a, uh, an era where uh, these, we think a passive piece of infrastructure will actually be talking to us and to each other all the time? I think that's exactly right. I mean, if you think about putting seismic sensors into bridges or you're putting you know, you can put any type of sensor in that will give you the current condition of whatever piece of infrastructure it is. And, you know, we've been doing it with a lot of the vaccines, just temperature man uh, monitoring as the vaccines are moving around the country. And so having that knowledge and getting that information and understanding what's going on is just, it's so important. And I think that the, the ability to have, uh, you know, a, a signal ahead of time, uh, to know when something's going to fail. I mean, in our homes, if we knew those kinds of things ahead of time, it would be certainly more convenient. But in the case of some of the critical infrastructure, it can be life-saving. So there's a there's just an awful lot we can do. And you know, it again, it's the technology is there now. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier, we announced these industrial connectivity products that actually go into hardened environments. So they actually connect back. The, you know, the sensors on the bridges get connected back to uh, a central location where you can then monitor them. And all the technology is there, so it's uh, it's possible for us to do it today. And in all the conversations that I have on the Hill, we try to remind everyone that not only do you want to drive infrastructure, but you really really do want to drive the smart infrastructure because it will change how we think about uh, you know safety in the future. Well, we've uh, learned, uh, Chuck, and you know this uh, far better than 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 most, is that 
Connected systems are also vulnerable to attack from outside. As you and I are talking, uh, half a world away in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, President Biden and President Vladimir Putin of Russia are, are sitting talking. And we think that one of the major issues that they're going to discuss is Russia, uh, Russian cyber uh, meddling, uh, cyber attacks. And in particular, this recent series of ransomware attacks that uh, it's said are not officially uh, Russian government sponsored, but are, are being done by Russian hackers inside Russia. I want to ask you a, a, about this question of vulnerability of of these uh, marvelous uh, connected systems that you're that you're building out. H how do we make them less vulnerable? And just for a, a starter, what would you like to see personally come out of the meeting between uh, Putin and, and Biden that uh, begins to give a, a safer uh, environment uh, for, for cyber systems generally? Well, David, I think that the thing that needs to happen is that security has to be designed in from the beginning. I mean, when we build houses today, uh, we we build the security into the house. We build, we put the locks in the house. We lock, put the windows, you know, the locks on the windows. We put security systems in the house. We 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 cover every angle of that, and it's no different when you're doing this technology. And when you're implementing the technology, you need to architect the security in uh, from the beginning. And with the same analogy, the employees in an organization then have to do the right things. You have to have have to actually lock the doors when you leave. You have to set the alarm when you leave. And I think. You know, the, the behavioral aspect uh, of these organizations and the people aspect is in many cases the biggest issue. And as it relates to the meeting going on right now, I don't think this is a country specific issue. Uh, there are certainly numerous state actors that are uh, participating in cyber. Uh, we have to defend against that. Uh, but there are also, you know, there, there are bad actors in the United States or bad actors everywhere who are trying to attack our systems. Obviously, we've seen all the ransomware attacks of late. Uh, the cryptocurrency is is making it, you know, so in some cases, uh, historically, it's been untraceable. Obviously, the uh, the FBI, I think, made some progress on that recently. But it's a, it's a big issue that has, you know, the technology is there. The security products and technology are there as well. And they need to be architected in. And then we have to get the human behavior to follow so that we don't click on those links and we don't do those things and we change our passwords. I mean, most of the attacks that are successful are made possible by bad hygiene. And so it's really important that we take the technology that we have today, the security technology, and we implement it effectively. We train our employees and we help them understand what they must do in order to protect the enterprise. A point t taken on the on the bad hygiene uh, aspect of this problem, but but I want to uh, press you on this question of, of building greater security into systems in the first place. Is there an, an engineering solution to this problem? The internet was designed to be open, um, transparent, global. Uh, safety and security, as I read this history, were really secondary concerns. And I, and I wonder whether it's really possible to go back and re-engineer it so that safety and security are primary. Is that possible? It, it is possible. And uh, the technology is, is there today. It's complicated. Don't get me wrong. But we're, we're out refreshing these, these systems. I mean, we're, we're facing increased bandwidth, increased video traffic. What we're doing right now is happening all over the world, all day, every day. And so we're refreshing the infrastructure, we're putting in higher speeds. So there's always an opportunity to implement more security as well. And there's, there's architectures that I won't go into here, but uh, that have been designed uh, that you know began, originally what we would do is we would protect a physical enterprise. So if you think about the house analogy, you would protect your physical enterprise with a perimeter-based system. And now with cloud and with people working from home, that perimeter doesn't exist anymore. So now we have to push security out to the endpoints. We have to push it to the cloud edge. And all of that technology exists. It is a different architecture. And, but we just have to make sure that we're uh, you know, vigilant uh, about deploying it properly and making sure our teams know and our, our employees know what to do and what not to do. And let's say 
10 years out, uh, given the pace of, uh, of investment and, and change in your industry, should our viewers expect that there will be engineered so solutions in place so that the safety is happening in the system, that we have to be less, uh, less focused on individual malware detection on our laptops or whatever? Are we heading toward that, that, that as I say, engineered solution to the problem? Well, I think the, the good news for all of us uh, companies who are in the cybersecurity business is that we we probably have a, uh, a, a great addressable market for a very long time because the bad actors are not going to go away and it's just going to continue to evolve. But I think there are there are lots of technologies that are being deployed today that are preventing uh, attacks. I mean, you can imagine for the number we hear about. Think about it, Dave, for a moment. We hear about a handful in a week. How many do you think are actually attempted? I mean, and, and the, the, the issue we face trying to protect our infrastructure is they only have to be right once, and we have to be right 100% of the time. And so in the big scheme of things, the technology is working relatively well. If you really step back and just think about how many you can assume are happening, and I talk to customers all around the world, and I can tell you, that there are organizations that are staring down hundreds of millions of attacks on a daily basis. And so there's a lot of great technology that's been deployed that are actually preventing lots of problems. And again, we just have to remain uh, vigilant in, in deploying this technology and, and trying to stay ahead of the bad guys. Two uh, recent scary examples where the actors penetrated whatever defenses there were were the ransomware attacks on uh, JBS Meatpacking and Colonial Pipeline. And uh, from what we know, both of those comp companies ended up paying a uh, ransom to the, to the attackers. What's your own view about whether a company should ever pay ransom uh, when they're attacked by these people who threaten to seize up, uh, basically uh, freeze their systems in a way that makes business impossible? Yeah, David, when you're sitting on the in, outside of the conference room where that discussion's occurring, it's quite easy to be ideological. Uh, but uh, when you're facing the, the situation that those CEOs and those you know security personnel are facing, first of all, you don't know all the issues that are occurring. And I think in many cases, those those CEOs or executives are thinking about the impact on their customers. And are they better off paying three and a half, four million dollars, even though they absolutely do not want to, but are they better off paying the three and a half to four million dollars to take care of their customers or or be ideological and hurt their customers? And so I think that's what it comes down to. And we, we've gone through exercises and that's what it comes down to every time is a rack. And what these uh, these actors are doing, they're, they're actually quite smart about it. They're They're placing reasonable requests they, they understand what you're, uh, you're able to afford. And so they're putting amounts in play that they know you can pay. That, you know, they're not asking you to put 500 million or a billion dollars in, in Bitcoin. They're asking for reasonable amounts. And the other thing is they're honest brokers. They actually do what they tell you they're going to do. So they have credibility when they go to the next one. And so it's a, it's a very interesting, it's almost a, a business model that they've established. And so Again, I think it's easy to be ideological when you're not sitting in the room, but those decisions come down to, you know, they're very complex. And in many cases, it comes down to they're going to pay the ransom because it's the best in the best interest of their customers. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to argue with that, even though it doesn't uh, it's not something that any of us naturally would like to do. I'll ask you about another uh, attack uh, of a different character. This seems to have begun really is as an intelligence collection effort. Uh, and that's the, the solar winds um, uh, uh, intervention within computer systems in supply chain uh, systems. Uh, there's been an interesting debate in the aftermath of solar winds about how best to, to protect companies against that kind of intrusion. I'm told that Microsoft, which was a key part of this story, urge companies to go more to the cloud and that you and Cisco Systems argue that the cloud may not be the best answer, that on-premises security 
uh, company by company may sometimes be a better solution. Can you just briefly tell our, our, our viewers how they ought to th think about this, this kind of threat and what to do about it? Well, I think first and foremost, when technology companies tell you to upgrade your software, you should do it, right? And, and I think that's one of the big issues, and this gets back to that hygiene discussion that we were having earlier. It, it's really important to stay updated. You know, when you, when you get your, your Android or your iOS device and, and Apple says there's a security patch, <laughs> you should upgrade because uh, you, you never know what's been discovered fully. And so, and, and these happen to every vendor too, by the way. We have them, every, every company has, security patches they put out because it's it's you know the the amount of code that we're all running on our technology is immense and so there's always an opportunity to have an issue and so i think first and foremost that that's really important and then on the cloud or non-cloud issue all, all i said was that i think the there are aspects of the cloud that for certain applications are going to be more secure and there are certain applications and certain things that are just so critically important to your the intellectual property of your organization that you may want to consider keeping it on-prem. And I think any anybody would agree with that assessment. And you see that happening in industries like financial services uh, where they're, they, they have a combination. This is where we talk about hybrid cloud, right? We talk about on-premise is, is referred to as a private cloud. And then you have the public cloud and most companies, most large companies are using a combination of, of uh, services from both and that's uh, that's really in many cases being done because of security and intellectual property issues. The U.S. obviously is in a significant uh, technology uh, competition with China. Uh, the uh, Senate just p passed a really interesting, uh, comprehensive new approach that called the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, which. Uh, basically would put uh, tens of billions of dollars uh, into uh, areas of U.S. high tech, in particular semiconductor manufacture in the U.S. Um, uh, curious what, what you think about uh, this growing uh, direct U.S. government investment and involvement in your business. Is this good? Um, what are the positives? What are you worried about uh, as the government moves a little bit closer to what we used to call uh, industrial planning. Yeah, I think for uh, for those who, who don't understand, a lot of that uh, funding is going into the National Science Foundation, NSF, so that they can do research on some of the new technologies. And I think that's a good thing. I think that's, uh, that's very positive. I think expanding semiconductor capacity in the U.S. and candidly, I think Europe needs to expand and build capacity out to just give us geographic diversity, if nothing else, and, and stopping, not even talking about the geopolitical rationale for why the U.S. wants to do it. So I think that's really important as well as we're all experiencing this current semiconductor shortage because so many devices, back to our original discussion around infrastructure, so much of this technology is going into everything now. I mean, you, you hear about the auto manufacturers and the number of semiconductors that a car has in it now. So we need that capacity, and I think that's very wise for them to do so. The thing that I've been encouraging lawmakers to do is think, think more about public-private partnerships than you have in the past, because we have a lot, of, a lot of innovation that's going on. We have a lot of people who understand what needs to be built five, six, seven years from now. The issue really comes down to, does the business model of being a publicly traded company in America give you the ability to invest seven years out, eight years out? In some cases we, we do, in other cases where the market opportunity may be smaller, but super strategic, then those are areas where I think we need to think about it between Washington and the private sector. And it's not just Cisco, there are a lot of other tech companies working on issues of artificial intelligence, issues of, you know, the, the 5G network uh, technology called Open RAN. Uh, so there's a lot of, uh, lot of areas where I think uh, that um, we could do public-private partnerships, much like the way the semiconductor issue is being handled today. Those are clearly going to be, you know, private companies, uh, private sector companies that are actually going to execute on that. And I think there's so many other areas of technology that we should be doing that exact thing. A particular area of technology for, for your company uh, has been 
uh, your uh, WebEx division, uh, which is in the teleconferencing uh, business, one that we've all embraced in a way we never could have imagined. Uh, you've got uh, a new WebEx suite that's meant, as I understand it, to support a hybrid work environment where some employees are working from home, some are in the, in the office. We're all trying to figure out what uh, our work lives are going to look like uh, as we get more people vaccinated, more people back to work. What's your own judgment and how are you designing this WebEx uh, suite for the, the, the hybrid workplace of the future? Yeah, David, there's a couple of things I think are important. Our, our discussion earlier about security, these, these platforms have to have security designed into them and we built WebEx with enterprise grade security to begin with, which is why they're being used in legislatures all around the world to actually having kept the governments running during this time. So that's that's really important. Uh, secondly, you know, there's there's a lot of analysis going on, a lot of speculation around what what is the work world going to look like as we come out of the pandemic. And uh, there's a recent survey that I saw that said 58 percent of workers say that in any given month they're going to work eight days at least eight days from home so you have sort of half the workforce saying they're going to work almost half the time from home which means you know that 98 percent of the meetings that we have in the future are going to include a remote attendee which means that these platforms have to be designed to support that's what we're talking about hybrid work and there's a role for them to play, these platforms like WebEx to play, where they drive inclusivity in these discussions. And so a lot of what we're doing is building technology and capabilities into this so that every person feels like they're involved in the discussion. Every person feels equal in the discussion. And this, and this is really difficult because for all of us who have been in a meeting where there's you know, eight people in a conference room and they're three people remote, those three people remote might as well not be in the meeting historically. And so a lot of the effort that's gone in, the WebEx suite that has been launched actually last week uh, has a lot of the technology in it that we think will help make these hybrid meetings. Uh, you know, our, our team likes to say they want to have a 10x experience for these hybrid meetings versus what you actually get in person. And uh, it's, uh, it's a tall order, but I think the teams have done an amazing job uh, and look, there's a lot of platforms that were used during the pandemic. There are a lot of companies were just saying, what, what can I use? Help me get you know, up and running. And now most of the customers are making longer term strategic architectural decisions about hybrid work. And that's where we think WebEx is really going to shine. From what I read, uh, Chuck, uh, you were talking about trying to start bringing your employees back to the office. Uh, next month in July, is that still going forward? And what percentage would you guess would be back uh, July, September in that time frame? Yeah, we're starting on July 1st in the United States. Other countries, we, we've, we've already got employees back. In some countries, we do not, obviously. So we're doing it at a country by country basis. And I think that we're going to start in July with you know five to ten percent, and then but we're gonna we're gonna move pretty quickly. I think uh, as we just want to we want to go a little slow so that we can, uh, as every company does, so that we can learn the issues uh, and understand what changes we need to implement in sort of the the, the workflow of coming to the office uh, in this new world. Uh, and so, you know, I don't I don't I don't know what the percentage will be by the end of September. It's really going to be dependent upon what we learn and how fast we think we can go. The great news is is that organizations like the Business Roundtable, which I'm on the board and, and, and an active participant, uh, you know, we're sharing a lot of insights with each other about what we're learning. So I think we're all going to move pretty quickly through this and get to whatever that end state looks like for every company. Every company is going to be a little different. You hear, you hear, uh, you know, CEOs talking about what their strategy is. And I think there's a lot of consistency in some, and then others are going in completely different directions. And I think we're going to learn over the next three, six, 12, 24 months, you know, what, what's the right solution for a given organization? We have just a minute left in that time. I just want to ask you a quick question about, about Cisco and its company culture. I remember going out to see your predecessor, John Chambers, uh, at your company headquarters uh, in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And uh, I remember him saying that uh, if somebody comes to us and, and they're a 10 for 10 hitter, we 
tell them Cisco may not be the right place for you. We're really looking for the, the man or woman who bets seven out of 10, meaning takes more chances, um, is, is not trying to be a perfectionist, uh, that the 10 for 10 person is, isn't the, enough of a risk taker. So simple question, uh, are you hiring uh, enough of those seven out of 10 hitters today? Uh, are you still taking risks even as you get bigger and more successful? Yeah, David, it, you know, I, I'm proud of what our teams have accomplished. We've been the number one global workplace two years in a row. And uh, it's, it's because we hire great people and uh, we want people who do take risks. We want people who are super competitive, but also are caring and compassionate. And uh, it's really important because we care about the communities we operate in. So we want to win in business so that we can actually do great things around the world. And that's, uh, that's really what we're focused on. So Chuck Robbins, Chief Executive of Cisco Systems, thanks for a great conversation about all things tech. Uh, join us uh, coming up at 11 today. Uh, we'll have an interview with Andy Slavitt, who just left the White House after serving as a senior advisor on COVID response. Tomorrow morning at nine, I'll be back uh, here with you for an interview with Ben Rhodes, uh, who was a former top national security official uh, with President Obama. We'll talk about a lot of things, but one of them is going to be the summit taking place right now between President Biden and Vladimir Putin. Thanks for joining Washington Post Live.